All right, now this is the odd part, right? This is where we just never know when we're actually live. So I just kind of start talking and hope that, you know, as soon as we're live, I'll kind of know it. But I think we're live now. So welcome, everybody. My name is Michael Hellickson. I'm one of the coaches here at Club Wealth Coaching and Consulting. Super excited today. I've got my co host, Brian Curtis, with me. And we are here with Jay Glazer of Corcoran Real Estate, uh, as in the, the great Barbara Corcoran, although I've been told she does not actually own the company anymore uh but uh but jay is with the company that is of course her namesake and uh has been a very powerful and very well uh, respected and well-renowned uh, real estate company in new york for a long long time and uh so jay is going to share with us how he did 2.2 million in gross commission income that's not volume you guys now remember we never talk in terms of volume because it always sounds better than it is uh but 2.2 million in gross commission income in 2018. Jay's obviously doing a very good job. And uh, and so Jay, welcome to Club Wealth TV. We're certainly excited to have you. And uh, for those that don't already know him, I'll just introduce Brian real quick. Brian Curtis, my co-host, is in also another really big me metropolitan area, uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, which... Uh, <laughs> Any of you have no clue what I'm talking about, and that's okay. Our price point is just shy of Jay's, just this, just shy. Really close. <laughs> one, one twenty. That's awesome. So Brian, uh, you know, pretty consistently, you know, he's well over 300 transactions a year, uh, runs a very stable and consistent business there, and uh, is also one of our Club Wealth coaches, does a great job of really helping people to grow their business, take it to the next level. So that said, without any further ado, Jay Glazer, welcome to Club Wealth TV. How are you, brother? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Happy to be yeah, here. We're super glad to have you. So tell us really quick, first of all, what, what what is it like? What's just in general, what is selling real estate in New York even like? I mean, it just seems so different than anywhere else. You know, selling New York City real estate is so different, but in so many ways, it's also exactly the same. Uh, fundamentally, it's exactly the same, but but it's a, it's, it is a different market. I mean, New York City is all of the stereotypes that you've heard that it is. It's fast paced, it's ferocious, it's competitive. I think there's something like 29,000 real estate agents in the five boroughs, which is just an obscene number. Um, it's sexy. There's a lot of beautiful, beautiful homes. A lot of the world's wealth and masses live here. Um, so it's it's just a you know one of the things we always try to do as an, as an agent is identify what our daily routine is going to look like. And I can say with certainty that in New York City specifically, there is no day like another. Yeah, I can imagine. So, okay, so let me ask you. So, which first of all, which borough are you in? <laughs> so, I am I am physically located in Manhattan. I am a born and raised New Yorker, so I've actually lived in Manhattan for let's call it ninety percent of my life. Uh, that being said, my team and I operate mostly in the boroughs of Manhattan, some Brooklyn, and some Queens. Uh, obviously, in the news recently was Long Island City because of Amazon. So that's a marketplace we've done some business in as well. Okay. It's, it's always interesting to me when, whenever somebody says the, the boroughs, I mean, it just, I can't, I don't know, for, for whatever reason, and this is totally, totally random and totally uh, will, will make no sense to anybody. Brian, I'll especially appreciate this. So for some reason I'm picturing like a, 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 some, a little creature Somebody's burrowing burrow. out of, you know, like trying to get out, right? Like it's like, save me, right? It's like, it's like the, the groundhog. Does it see its shadow when it comes out of its little burrow? I don't know, but uh, oh, go ahead. Look like uh, just... I, I, yeah, well, I was going to say the reason I say boroughs is because so many people say they're from New York and there is, in my eyes, a distinction between between being from New York City, being from one of the five boroughs and being from, say, Long Island or Connecticut, New Jersey. A lot of people say, oh, I'm basically from New York City, but they actually grew up in New Jersey across the water. So, you know, I have a sense of pride having been a na being a native New Yorker and have, having been, been born on the island of Manhattan. So call it what you will, but you know that's why I always mention actually being in New York City proper. I see Brian smiling because I have a feeling he gets it. I, I, I think I, you know I'm from the part of the state that uh, you know upstate, just outside of Buffalo, so it's a little bit different. We we don't talk about boroughs or anything like that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I always make used to make a joke that you guys were the part of the state that made my taxes go up, but that's a different. I'm, story. I'm, I've heard that many times, <laughs> many, many times from non from non New York City residents. We're also generating more money than I'm pretty sure any other city in America. So you know, there's that. 
it, it's a good trade off. It's, hey, it's we'll take it. funny. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. All right. So talk to us about, you know, kind of, you know, what's it like? So, so, you know, you're in this massive city, right? The biggest city in the world, like this huge city. And yet you're trying to make your mark against 20, what did you say? 29,000 other agents or some crazy. Yeah. Number. Like yeah. And yeah. so, so how are you doing that? What are you doing to stand out? You did $2.2 million in commission income last year. How did you get there? What, what are the things that you're doing to set yourself apart and, and open up those opportunities? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's no real um, silver bullet or secret sauce to being a great agent as far as I'm concerned. I mean, what, what I do, I think more distinctly than, than a lot of other agents are the good old fashioned, you know, fundamentals. Uh, so, for example, just this morning, I noticed that my team and I, I was the first person in the office, followed by another team member followed by another team member. And we were the first three people physically in the office this morning uh, for no reason other than that's how our team fundamentally works, right? So there is no substitute for hard work as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so you ask how I've done it. I, you know, out hustling, the competition has always been something that's been critically important to me from day one. There's this idea, especially in the millennial community, which I confess I technically am a millennial, uh, that, you know, working nine to seven or nine to eight or Saturdays or Sundays is somehow it makes you special or you're, you're unique or you're doing going the extra mile. In my eyes, working seven days a week is both standard and desired in many ways. So, you know, so for me, I don't have the sense of this is me working hard. This is just me working period. This is what's in my DNA to just work to that level. So for, for starters out working everybody, second of all, I would say, a very critical component of our business is just market knowledge. You know, really understanding the process A through Z in a way that very few do, so that when we can actually sit down with a customer, whether that's a potential seller or a potential buyer, we can really walk them through the buying and selling process with such finite detail that they're absolutely confident that they're, we're the right person for the job. Um, and then I would say we also just, you know, there was, there was an article, a very, very pleasant and flattering article written about me in a listing last week and the, and the, the journalist. Uh, and as you know, the media can also sometimes be your friend and sometimes be your enemy. Um, and this particular journalist said, you know, Jay Glazer goes the extra mile. He's not your average agent. So the third thing I think we do that's very distinguished is our marketing and our brand. We, you know, we really, really try to push the envelope on how we engage in the marketplace, whether that's engaging other agents or engaging the consumer and bringing new ideas and, and a new level of um, just consumer experience that I think very few agents have actually done. And I think that helps with our identity and our business. Okay, so I got to I got to challenge you a little bit on that for on a couple of things first, and and and, and I, I'm I'm very curious about this. So number one, you said that you're outworking everybody. You're working seven days a week, and I got to tell you that just sounds horrible to me. Uh, and Brian, <laughs> I don't know about you, I got I got a feeling Brian's probably feeling the same way. Like seven days a week, no freaking way. I mean, I've been there, done that. And it sucks. It's no fun. Uh, and, you know, one of our, in fact, our very core value at Club Wealth is no success in the world can compensate for failure in the home. So one of the things that we really focus on is we want to get every one of our coaching clients taking at least one full day off each week, um, you know, where they're completely uninterrupted by phone, email, text message, Facebook, whatever, where they can literally just spend time with their family. So the, the question I have for you is, are you a single guy? Do you have a family? Or is, I mean, is this like, it's working seven days a week if you're not a single guy would be pretty tough, I would think. Yeah, listen, I, I completely value what people need to have in their lives in order to feel fulfilled and, and feel complete and, and have a sense of, um, you know, balance. I think that's super important. From the point I was trying to make about the seven days is not that I don't value time off or think people should take time off. It's that for me, it's just an innate quality that I don't feel like I'm, it's a chore to work seven days a week, right? If, if you say, hey, what makes you happiest? And I said, what, what, what makes me happiest is working seven days a week, then I'm, fulfill, I'm feeling fulfilled by doing what makes me happiest. So that was my point about, about working seven days a week, is that the hard work is not something I think as work, I just think of it as what I do. But to answer your question, I do have a girlfriend, but I do not have kids and I do not have a, a spouse at home. And so I absolutely can over-index and over-leverage on time spent building, building my career. 
Okay, that's well, good for you. I mean, if it works for you, it works for you. I get it. I just, holy cow. Wow, that's a lot. Okay, so now the other thing that I wanted to ask you about is you talked about brand awareness. And I'm thinking, okay, how big is New York ballpark? How many how many citizens in New York all together? It's going to be like five or six billion people, I would say. Five or six million. And that's in a very no, small no, area. billion, right? billion, not million. Oh, did you say billion? billion? I'm sorry, billion. <laughs> is it really that much? I'm pretty sure that's how it is in the, in the, five, the five boroughs. Five or six billion? Billion, that's insane. That's, I have no idea how big, Brian, are you, yeah, I got a feeling Brian's Googling it. I can see it. I, can I see could it. be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's something in that ballpark. It could be more. Whatever it is, it's ridiculous. What 8. do you got, 6 Brian? 6 million is what the New York City population is. 8.6 million with an M? Yes, as of, as oh, of 2017. Sorry. So it's probably closer to nine now. That's a 2017 number. Okay. Oh, All right. So a lot, whatever it is, it's a big number, right? Re- regardless of what the number is, it's a big number. So, so here's, here's the thing. And cause I hear a lot of agents, you know, they get focused on, Oh, I want to build a brand and I want to get my, mm-hmm brand out there and I got to have the perfect logo and I got to, it's all about branding, branding, branding. And here's the concern that I have with that. The concern that I have with that is right now, you know, so last year and you're doing a lot of high-end stuff, right? You're, you know, so 38 units, 2.2 million in gross commission income, your average sales price is pretty solid, right? You don't have an idea what your average is right now? It's like two to two and a half. Okay. So you're about two, two and a half million in, in your average price point. So the reality is your price points are really high. That said, in a city of over, would you say, Brian, 8 million people? Almost nine. Eight, almost 9 million people and doing 38 transactions. No, no amount of branding you're doing is really is really penetrating the market. Do you, do you know what I mean? I, I mean, there's, there's, there's people, if I ask the average New Yorker who Jay Glazer is, they're going to have no idea. And I don't mean that as an insult or anything like that. My point is simply this. While I think, you know, having a nice brand when people do engage with you is important and it helps and it brings value and, you know, and all that. The concern that I have is that so many agents out there, when they hear branding, they think I've got to go create a brand. And by creating a brand, I'm going to get business. And the reality is that is not going to happen. Nobody's going to come to you because you're, first of all, you're not million dollar listing on TV guy, right? You're not whatever Josh Altman or whatever, you know, that's, that's not, that's not who we are. And if, if we were, then yes, people would be attracted to us. It'd be very easy to get business that way. But for the rest of us, normal human beings, right? We're just not that guy. And so what I want to know is how are you getting your business? Are you calling Fismos expireds? Are you doing marketing on TV, radio? Are you billboards? Are you, uh, you know, what, what is it you're doing specifically to lead generate? Okay. So let me, let me just clarify what I meant by brand. I agree with you. When I see someone post a video about a day in the life of the agent, I think to myself, you've just spent X thousands of dollars on something that will literally do nothing for your business. Well, it, right. it is just a, a self-aggrandizing, self-fulfilling video that, that will serve very little purpose. When I say brand, I'm not talking about the Jay Glazer brand. I'm talking about how our listings appear to the consumers and how our business appears to consumers. So when I say brand, I'm saying when someone hires me to sell their home, there's a certain expectation of what's involved in terms of our marketing, our approach, how we're, how we're distributing the listing, how we're, maintain, how we're maintaining the listing, how we're engaging with other brokers, right? There's a sense of, there's a, there's a degree of marketing. We don't have an MLS in New York, so getting your listings in front of other agents is not just snapping your fingers and they show up on an ML, ML, MLS. So there's a degree of skill and strategy involved in that. So when I say brand, that's to, that's what I'm referring to in the context of this conversation. Yeah, I'm glad um, to hear that. That's very different than what most agents to determine, you know, call brand. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, you know, the, the amount of overemphasis on say what your business card looks like is obscene to me. But again, that's, that's not what, there is that component of brand. And I think, I think there's something to be said about being polished and having everything cohesive and looking like it makes sense and fits in with each other. Uh, that being said, that's, that's not necessarily what I was speaking about when I was saying how we, how we build business and build brand. Um, so how we generate business, I, I would say 90 to 95% of our core business is referral based. So one thing that I have been fearless in doing um, since I've basically been an independent agent, so I'll say for the last seven or eight years, because I was, you know, somebody's assistant on teams, et cetera, got into the business, got your feet wet, that sort of thing. Um, but 
when I went out on my own, one thing that I was so confident in was that I was providing an exceptional level of service to my clients. And I still fundamentally believe that. And I think that for any agent listening, you have to believe that you are providing an unparalleled service in order for you then to go ahead to those clients and say, listen, I'm leaning on you to send me your friends, family, relatives, whomever it is who's going to buy or sell something in the next year, two years, right? If you don't refer me business, you as my clients haven't done your job and haven't fulfilled your end of the agreement, right? I, I remember anecdotally, I, I sat down with one client who bought a, a $4 million property with me. So he bought a very expensive home and it was his first purchase, right? So he was going from a rental to a $4 million home. That's a giant leap, right? That's a stressful leap. That's a very, very big investment. And I remember at, after he bought the home, he said, it's on my to-do list to send you three referrals this year. Right. And that that's what I owe you. Three referrals. Right. It was it wasn't just, oh, yeah, I'll be sure to name drop you when I'm speaking to my friend. He actually had a list, of, you know, me on a list of things that he wanted to accomplish for that year, which was sending referrals. So for me, I'm very, very aggressive at asking for the business, not in a salesman sort of way. I think people are afraid that asking for the business, you're doing something salesman or or gross or wrong. But I know that I feel fundamentally convinced and, sh and strongly that if my, my people who work with me are better off than people who work without me. And so when I have that philosophy internalized, I am fearless when it comes to asking for the business. So 90 to 95% of our business comes through referral. So Jay, let's talk about this because I conceptually, I appreciate what you're saying. I think it's a, it's a great idea, but you know, dumb it down for us. And what I mean by that is there's people listening to our, our conversation right now and they're saying, sure. so Jay asks for referrals, Jay does a good job. And I, and I appreciate all that, but you know, a couple of very specific questions at what sure. point in the transaction are you asking for them? How many times are you asking for them? And are you offering anything in return for them? Sure. So great questions. And I, I'll tell you a few different strategies. So the minute, a closing happens and we're shaking hands and hugging and everybody's super excited. And the minute someone says, you did a really great job for us, I write them back, or I, you know, depends if it's face-to-face, -face, if it's a text, if it's a phone call, whatever, whatever the case may be, I'll say back to them, I need two things from you uh, if you really do appreciate what we did. One, I would really love a review, obviously, because that's, again, going back to brands, Michael, there is there is your online presence and whether people can see what you've done for other people. So getting a review, um, which admittedly, you know, there's always things we don't do perfectly in this industry. And I would say getting reviews from the beginning of my career till now has not been a strong suit. So I've been more focused on that. Um, and then the second thing I'll ask for is great. You know, if you think we did a really good job, Hey, Hey, John, I know that you work uh, at a bank and that you're on the floor with 25 other people who might be looking to buy or sell homes. If you happen to have a conversation with them uh, about, about real estate, don't forget, you know, I would love to have an opportunity to work with them. So I would say right after the transaction is one. Additionally, one thing that I think people historically, especially in New York City, have run away from is buy side mm -hmm. transactions. So I know that in other marketplaces, you have buyer's agents and therefore, you know, the, the, the rainmaker or the team leader might be the listing person and might, and might deal with mostly listings. On our business, we're very, very buy side heavy and I myself represent the buyers. Now that kind of comes full circle when you're talking about how much time you, you spend working, right? When you're working with buyers, it's extremely time consuming. There's no way around that. But when you're face to face with a buyer, for hours on end, helping them consummate what is perhaps the most financially and, and, and emotionally deepest and, and richest transaction for them. There's a connection that you simply can't get when you're working with the listing, right? Because you're dealing with the seller intermittently. You're dealing with the seller uh, only when you really have something substantive to bring them. But with a buyer, you're constantly engaged with them. So another way I ask for business, or, and, and oftentimes it does, I don't even have to ask for it because it's just, it's just organic, is when I'm out with a buyer and I'm providing value and service, They'll say, oh, by the way, my friend so-and-so is also looking to buy a home. Great. I'd love, to, I'd love to be in touch with that person. Please make sure you know, that I can get in touch with them. How should I get in touch with them? Should I call them? Should I send them a text? And then that will parlay itself into another business. So oftentimes you're working with a buyer and that turns into 2x or 3x what you originally intended it to be. So that's the second mode in which I ask for the business. And then the third one, which is just, again, fundamental business practice, is just when you make your follow-up calls to people. Hey, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, How's the home treating you? How's the kids? What's going on in your life? By the way, if you happen to know anybody who's looking to buy or sell real estate, you know, just please keep us in mind. You know, we'd love to be able to help those people as well. Okay, so then 
Oh, oh, Brian, sorry. Did you have a follow up on that, Brian? Okay. You... okay. So then I, I get that. And those, those are great things to do, but how about before you have the client, right? So these are all things that you're doing with existing clients. What about your mm -hmm. sphere of influence? What are you doing with your at large sphere of influence? People that you knew growing up, people that, mm -hmm. you know, your mother, brother, sister, cousin, doctor, mm -hmm. You know, butcher, baker, salad maker, whatever. Like, what are you doing with those people uh, to sure. get them, you know, to first of all, stay top of mind. And second of all, to get them sending you referrals. Yeah. So, uh, you know, again, no, nothing that no one else can do. It's something everybody can do. I, for example, I was texting with a high school friend, right? So I did grow up here. So I'm privileged to at least have a very local sphere of influence uh, because this is my home. So I was texting with a friend I went to high school with and I said, hey, man, we're overdue. Let's get drinks. So we set a date or we, we agreed to get drinks. Then we set a date, which happened to be tomorrow, for example. And I said, why don't we invite X, Y, and Z? So we call, I called uh, five or six other friends who we went to high school with. And now tomorrow I turned into a six to eight person, you know, small get together, very informal, um, where we'll just catch up. At those meetings, you know, I will either in a serious way, depending on how the conversation goes, tell, remind them what I do for a living and that, you know, I'd love to be able to help those people that they know if it's, or themselves, uh, or in a more joking way, sort of like a elbow kind of to the rib cage sort of way. I'll just you, you remind them that like, Hey, you know, I, 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 I want to be more successful. I want to have more clients, you know, don't, don't forget to think about me in, the, in that light. Um, so I think that just staying top of mind is such an important component of this industry because you could, you could lose touch with a client and then six months later, they resurface with someone else because you just didn't stay top of mind for them. So, so in terms of the people who aren't yet my clients, I would say my sphere of influence, I'm always in front of, of whether it's other professionals who could be referring me business like a bank lender or an attorney or a, an accountant or a divorce attorney or whatever that person, whoever that person may be, just staying in front of those people, right? For me, for example, um, one of my major passions is playing golf. Obviously in New York City right now, it's not golf weather, but I just came back from a four day golf trip where, I don't know, six to eight of the, of the 20 guys on the golf trip are in real estate in New York City. I didn't, I didn't specifically go there to network or use any of these, you know, or go there to like hand out my business card, but I got to know guys that I like and I want to be friends with and I am now friends with and I will keep them as part of my sphere of influence that I'm ever expanding, right? So when I when the summer hits in, in a month or two or not the summer, but the spring in New York City and the golf course is open, we'll go hit the links together and I'll just be in front of them top of mind and in a very organic way because they know that I know my stuff about how seriously I take my business. It's all self-fulfilling. Uh, I'll likely get some business out of it. So are you out there on the golf carts taking calls or, you know, you're in the golf cart, you're writing down notes and all this stuff. Better not be so if you're playing with me. So actually, <laughs> funny enough, I was, uh, it was Sunday and it was the last day of our 20 person tournament. And the guy I was playing with who is in real estate was like, can you please get off your phone and hit the, the golf shot? So Dude, I, I got to tell you that, that does not sound good to me. <laughs> <laughs> hey Jay, let's let's switch gears a little bit if you don't mind. So um, I appreciate that you're doing a lot of business per referral. It's it's really you know it's one of the the best ways to you know keep your costs low. It's one of the best ways to you know build a business uh, on a slow steady uh, pace. But let's I would like to talk about what you call branding and just mm -hmm. kind of get an idea. So it's a very interesting statement that you make that there is no MLS in New York City. And honestly, mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Um, you know, I've I've done real estate for a long time. And I think that's probably the first place I've ever heard that doesn't have an MLS. So, um, you know, that's a really interesting idea. So tell me some of the stuff that you're doing that you feel like markets your listings that pushes you ahead. So if I'm, if I'm a consumer and I go, why, why should I pick Jay? What are the things that are, that are doing sure. that are who go above and beyond? Yeah. So one thing that we do uh, and we invest heavily in, um, I hate to, I hate to sound so cliche, but sometimes money talks, you know, are you willing to make an investment in your business? that helps distinguish you from your competitors. Uh, and for us, the answer is yes, when it comes to videos. Um, so we, uh, we have, uh, you know, a, a, I would say a, a very strong foot in the door in one specific building uh, right near where I live um, and very close to our office as well. And this building, I've, I've sold, you know, four of the last six homes in. Um, and as a result, 
we, you know, we kind of become the building specialists. And one thing that it seems that everybody in the building really appreciates about our marketing for their listings is the videos that we're doing. So um, we are, do, we're not just doing, you know, your generic listing video that kind of surveys the property. We're really trying to tell a story. We're trying to craft a video that caters both the, the property and how to show off the space, but also caters to potential lifestyle and just makes the listing more memorable. You know, I, I never try to convince the seller that, hey, this video is going to get your listing sold. That's highly, highly unlikely, but the listing, the video will get your listing remembered so that when they're going through what's available and what the options are, either, either other agents will say, oh, that's the video, the listing with the video. Uh, and therefore, you know, it's something that they're, again, going to stay top of mind for them. Or if it's the consumer, they're like, oh yeah, that was the one with the video. You know, I should revisit that property. Maybe that's the right property for me. Um, so for us, I would say that the video is a really, really big component. And again, like also just the, just the consumer experience online. You know, we put a very, very high emphasis on, on how our, our, our photo presentation looks for people. You know, I think people just assume you hire the photographer, you go in, you click a few photos, you're out, bing, bam, boom. For us, our, our photo shoots last anywhere from two to four hours. We are, we are moving things around in the home. We are prepping the home. We're getting every possible angle. If I see something slightly off kilter, I'll want to modify it and reshoot that listing. I want, you know, I, my father was in fashion for 30 plus years. And so he puts a high emphasis on presentation. I want our properties to be presented in the best possible way so that we will never be overlooked by any customer who even has like one iota of consideration for our homes. Okay. I like that idea. So um, you don't have to answer this question, but uh, I'm going to ask it anyway. So, you know, <laughs> You know, when, when you see things like 38 transactions and 2.2 million in GCI, and if, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, if my numbers are off, it's still generally yeah, close. So. Um, you know, if I'm listing a $2 million house, you know, how much money are you spending on marketing, if you don't want me asking? Just because yeah. I think sometimes people look at that and go, oh, he just, you know, flaps it up in the MLS or not, just puts mm -hmm. it out there, doesn't do anything. You know, how much money are you spending to get that quality that you're talking about? Sure. Yeah, listen, I mean, our videos range roughly between four and five thousand dollars a pop. Um, so okay. that's a pretty substantial investment. Um, and uh, our photo shoots, again, the average photo shoot, I would say in New York City is roughly three to four hundred dollars. Our photo shoots range typically from like eight hundred to fifteen hundred dollars. So, gotcha. you know, I don't know. I can't speak for what other agents are spending, but I can definitely speak to what their listings look like versus ours. And I would say our our investment is substantially higher generally speaking now does that change my revenue of course it does but i think that more more listings equals more revenue therefore it's a long-term investment in that model right it's not a, it's not for short-term gain right because every listing that i'm doing a video and i'm obviously chopping off you know 0.33 percent of my commission of, of one point of my commission or whatever it is right so there's definitely you know you have to look at the bottom line and you have to analyze is it worth the investment and for some listings listen i have to be realistic you're not likely to shoot this kind of video for a five hundred thousand dollar home it's just not in the budget but for a home that's upwards of two million dollars and you know that long term it could help other business in that building or in that area it's, it's a worthwhile investment yeah, I love that you're spending money. I think it's important. I think too many people, you know, cut the corners and don't look at that. And uh, so anyway, sounds like Michael has another question. Yeah, my question is, you know, OK, I want to come back to this whole we don't have an MLS thing. And and, and this, <laughs> is, this is my shout out to the Zillow haters of the world, uh, you know, but I really I, I, and, and, and I'm saying that, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek. But the, but the reality is that you know not having an mls also means that you're not sharing data with zillow and realtor.com and these other portals out here which could have a, it would be very interesting I'm, I'm i'm curious to see what happens in new york versus the rest of the country that is sharing this data uh and uh, you know how that impacts the future of real estate in new york as it as it relates to the rest of the country that being said how the heck do you get the word out? If like if I've got a buyer and I know my buyer wants a two to four million dollar property in you know whatever borough, you know how do I know how to how, what I'm looking at? How do I know what to show them? How how do I find yeah. these things? I mean, you guys don't have the big books anymore, so what do you got? How do you do this? Yeah, so uh, I will preface this this by saying there is what I would call an active cold war happening. But in, uh, in the industry, whether it's amongst the brokerages or amongst the Zillows versus the brokerages, every single firm through their own medium is fighting for market share of both the leads, meaning people who are clicking on the listings and saying, hey, I'm interested in that property. Um, and they're fighting for that. And they're fighting for 
how do we get our listings most prominently displayed with our information on them? Um, so we don't have an MLS, but we do have a back end system that is basically operated by our controlling governing, governing body, which is called the Real Estate Board of New York, uh, which essentially is our listings department, our company corporate listings department will feed the listing and its information to the central hub, which will then feed it back out to the various brokerages. So if, if, on, if on our internal listing system, I can see, okay, these 15 properties in this neighborhood were listed in the last five days. So you can, there are listing aggregators internally. So we have our own internal proprietary system. For the consumer, Zillow owns a company called Street Easy in New York City, which is essentially the New York City version of Zillow. Uh, so, so there's a constant struggle between the brokerages and uh, Street Easy for market share of the consumer attention. Um, so if you're a consumer and you're just trying to like, you wake up one morning, and you're like, hey, my wife is pregnant. I need to buy a bigger home. You start your search on Street Easy. Okay, so now let's back up a second. So you're saying, okay, there's no MLS, but there is a central repository for all these listings. How's that different than an MLS? Okay, so it's first of all, it's not an MLS because people have opted out and that's part of this cold war that's going on. So uh -huh. now a company like Corcoran is trying to say, hey, we have, uh, call it 33% of the market in terms of listings. And if we decide not to put our listings on Street Easy, this is not a one size fits all first one stop shopping for all of the listings in New York City. If you wanna find 33% of the listings in New York City, you have to come through Corcoran.com to find those listings. So that's the struggle and the fight. Every brokerage, Corcoran is just where we work, but but everybody has this, this, this ongoing struggle with Street Easy. The reason it's also not an MLS is because there are smaller firms who don't participate in it because it's pay to play. Right? Street Easy is not a free system. I don't know what the cost of an MLS is, but I, I, I am pretty sure it's much cheaper than operating through Street Easy. And now Street Easy is saying, hey, we'll put your listing on our website, but we're going to put somebody else's face on the listing. And that's part of the ongoing fight as well. My whole thing is, and the reason why I bring this up is because for me, this is just a bunch of noise. Right. When I sit there listening to the fight going on between this broker and that company and blah, blah, blah. To me, I just see opportunity. People are so concerned in what's happening rather than focusing on how they can be better at their business and how they can and get more business done. Right. You have to you have to just accept the rules of the game and play. Right. Like if they're changing the rules in baseball, as they're discussing, if you're a baseball fan about, you know, putting pitchers on a clock and things like that. Don't complain about it. Just adapt. Right. So for me. I don't care what the results are. I simply want to know what's the highest and best use of my skills in that current setting. And then let me go after as much business as I can. I like it. I'm going to ask a quick question. I just, just want to be quick. So what do you do for fiduciary duty? So for me, if I'm representing somebody and I don't know anything about Street Easy, but I grab the concept, if I don't mm -hmm. put that person's house on Street, on street Easy, I feel like I'm not marketing it you know, I've missed the X number of people who only check there. How, how do you, how do you deal with that? And is that a brokerage choice or is that an agent choice? So that's a very, very, very hot question right now that a lot, of, a lot of brokerages are trying to figure out. So for me personally, this goes back to the, the, the willingness to spend. I am, I put my properties and my clients first, right? So I rather be the guy who says, if it's $1,000 extra to put my listing on Street Easy, I will be the first person to do that, right? That's, that's smart. That's my fiduciary. That's my sense of obligation to my clients. There are other agents right now, and there are brokerages in general who say we need to take a stand and draw our foot in the sand and you know draw the line in the sand and say, we're not doing that. So there are agents who are actually opting out. How they deal with that fiduciary, that ethical dilemma of, is this for the greater good or is it for the good of my seller? That's up to them to decide. Gotcha. Okay. It's just an interesting question because it's really the question that we're asking nationwide with Zillow right now. Although I think the thing that, that the agents have missed with Zillow is they're a real estate company right now. So how can you choose to opt them out of, uh, out of the MLS? I think it'll be very challenging. I think we're going to lose that battle because I, the fact they became right. a real estate company. So, but that's a whole other three hour webinar. So I don't want to go down that road, but it's just an interesting question. It's something for people to think about out there. It's not just about 
what's best for us as agents. We have a fiduciary duty to our clients and we need to make sure that if we're making a choice not to put your put a house someplace that it is in the best interest of the client, not in the best interest of the agent. And that's a real dilemma I feel like we're facing in 2019. Yeah, and, and let me just bring up a quick point on that. I think that you then have to know what value and skill you're bringing to the seller when you're like, hey, my commission is 6%, no questions asked, right? Like you, you want someone who's gonna discount their commission and then discount the experience of where your home is online, or do you want someone who's going to make that investment and earn that commission because they're not, they're pulling out all the stops to get your home sold or you have to decide as the seller as well. Like you, you know, you, I hate to say, it, you get what you pay for, right? There are a lot of agents who will take the commission off or, or reduce the commission, but then reduce the marketing, right? So it's all relative. Yeah. I'll ask another question. This is kind of a fun road to go down that we don't go. So I, I can honestly say you're the first person I've talked to that spends $5,000 on a listing for video. And there's nothing wrong with that again. So I can't spend $5,000 on the, on the video because I listed a house yesterday for 171 and that's 5,100 in commission. It's bad math, but uh, that's funny. <laughs> actually a true story. Um, but anyway, here's my question. Have you brought that in house? I mean, if you're, if you're listing 20 houses a year for 5,000 a pop, um, you can pay a pretty good salary, even in New York city, hundred grand a year, probably is nothing to cough at. Right. So um, I have not brought the video, the videographer in house, but I have brought marketing in house. I think I'm one of the only teams uh, in New York City. I don't know the actual numbers, and I don't think there's a way to know the actual numbers. But I'm one of the only teams in New York City who has an on-team marketing manager, right? So, so when you look at his signature, it says marketing manager to the Glazer team, right? A lot of firms. One of the reasons why we all work at big firms is because there's a ton of resources available to us, but those resources are distributed amongst the masses, right? So, um, so every agent has access to the marketing team at Corcoran. No other agent has access to my marketing manager, right? Because he's on my payroll. So I have taken that in-house. And again, from a value add perspective, I tell sellers, listen, listing management, because of the lack of an MLS and because of the lack of syndication fluidity is a huge component of getting your home sold for a week, your listing could disappear from street easy. And no one even knows because you're out there working with buyers and this other listing that you forget to even check that simple, simple thing, but something that is as simple and important as it is. And, and, and then it's just poof, it's gone because you didn't, you didn't check. So I have someone whose full-time job is both to babysit our listings and make sure that the marketing experience is as good as it possibly can be. I think that's great. I think it's important. And I have a similar person um, on my team as well. And I think it's vital. And, you know, I've actually had listings disappear off of Zillow. Not that we have any control over that, but I've had it happen. And you, know, you get a pretty irritated seller when they're exactly. on Zillow. Exactly. They're looking at the listing, all of a sudden it disappears. And, you know, to your point, whether I'm paying you $5,000 or $50,000, I still deserve to have my house marketed in a professional manner. And that's, that's the other side. I, I know you guys, there's people out there going, well, I couldn't do any of this stuff. I couldn't afford it. It doesn't make sense for me, but I promise you there are ways to leverage these things. Uh, you know, hire somebody for $50,000 a year. That sounds like a lot of money, but you, you know, in some of those markets, $50,000 a year, a marketing manager, who's also a videographer, it's a real thing that you can do. And, you know, obviously in New York city, $50,000 buys you a cupcake and a cup of coffee, but you know, in other places in the market, it's a little bit more affordable. So I, I love that you've not gone and said, well, you know, I can't do this. I can't do that. You know, push the envelope on, on quality, you know, as we go into all of the shift that's ha happening and all of these things like open door and Zillow and offer pads and all these things, what are you bringing? Well, they're not going to spend $25,000 marketing your listing. I am, or I'm not going to, you know, so the more value that we bring instead of being door openers and contract writers, the more value we can bring, the more likely we are to stick around. So if you're out there scared to death of open, open door and Zillow and all those other eye buyers out there, bring value. Who knew? Right. I mean, you know, you don't have to spend $50,000 when there's a will, there's a way, right? Get a little creative. You can hire a decent virtual assistant for $300 a month and say, listen, your core task as my virtual assistant is every day, go on Zillow, go on our website, go on whatever websites your listing is appearing on in whatever market you're in and make sure the listing integrity is preserved. And that, and that you can then say to your seller, hey, I have uh, a listing manager on my prop, or, or, or I should say a um, 
a marketing manager on staff who is identifying any issues that might arise in the syndication and presentation of your home. Where you don't have to pay someone a full full salary, but you do have to be a little creative and a little thoughtful as to like how you're going to go about hiring that person. So, I mean, all of this leads me to wonder, why don't you have an in-house videographer? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a fair question. I mean, it, it's something. I mean, for the amount of money that you're spending on a video, I, I, it seems to me the economics, it's crazy not to have a full-time videographer. Well, so, so just to be clear, we don't do, we don't do a video on every listing. Um, but also listen, it's, we spend a lot of money. We have videos in our queue that haven't even been released yet, uh, for, you know, for other, other kind of video concepts we've been working on. It's a fair question. Um, it's something I should probably take a hard look at um, and, you know, figure out if it makes sense economically. I mean, it sure seems like it. If you're spending, you know, if you did 38 listings and you're spending five grand a listing on video, I mean, let's just do the math. 38 times 5,000. I mean, that's $190,000 a year. At $190,000, I'm pretty sure I could get some freaking Scorsese to come out and video my listings. I mean, <laughs> maybe I'm wrong, but. There's like a famous videographer. I want to hire one year for one of my listings, but I think it's going to be like fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> okay, but even fifty thousand dollars. I mean, gee, man, you're making one hundred and forty by hiring that guy. So, I mean, the, the economics to me seem pretty pretty reasonable. All right, so there, there's some good stuff here. I really appreciate all the stuff you shared. Um, I want to come back to some lead generation. So that you know, I really I want to understand. Uh, more about how are you following up with your sphere of influence? And, and again, there's lots and lots of ways to lead generate. Sounds to me like you're not doing any online lead generation or anything like that. That's not a big part of your business, uh, but you well, are. Go ahead. Are you? Just so one thing that I have been looking at, you know, in 2019 as the market shifts is like, how do we not solely rely on referrals, right? Especially if, if people are slowing down in the buying and selling of homes, they might not be thinking about real estate as often. Um, so one thing that I've really spent time thinking about with my team over the last couple of weeks is other, other pipelines. And, and, and I would say two that are, that are really important to us going forward are online leads, not necessarily paid leads, but like if someone inquires about a listing, you know, showing them the listing, we have their information and trying to, trying to, what we would call convert them, right? Convert them to a customer, convert them to a potential client. So that would be some form of online lead. And then the other form would be open houses. You know, we have, we have good listings that are getting decent traction. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are what I would call broker lists. And, you know, again, as I said earlier in the call is, you know, we do a lot of buy side business. So if people walk into one of your $3.6 million listings, you know, that's a potential buyer for that same budget you want to be able to convert that person okay so then uh, so you're doing open houses which is huge we love open houses we 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 share a massive open house strategy where a lot of our clients are getting anywhere from 50 to 150 people out to an open house that's huge um are you when you start working with a buyer are you using a buyer agency grant we actually don't um it's something that it's another one of these kind of fiduciary ethical is it the right thing to do struggles it's we've never used one in new york city that doesn't mean we shouldn't um but the reality is you know my whole sales pitch to, to buyers is i'm going to bring you so much value that you're never going to want to consider working with someone else okay so now for, and, so it's interesting you bring up the fiduciary ethical thing and how that could relate to a buyer agency agreement so are you saying that in some way it's possible that using a buyer agency agreement could be unethical? I wouldn't say necessarily unethical. I would say whether you are, you know, basically binding someone to you when they, when I feel they shouldn't be bound to you. Um, I struggle with that as a concept. Okay. So if, if, if you do use a buyer agency agreement and then at some point you or they feel like it's not the right relationship, you can always exit the agreement. You can always, you right. know, put a, you can put an easy exit clause in there. You could just simply sign it off. There's lots of things you could do. Um, that being said, I, 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 I say this because I'm very passionate about buyer agency agreements. I think that it's important to use buyer agency agreements um, for a number of reasons. Now, not everybody does. I'm sure Brian, I'm sure you don't use them on every, or do you use them on every transaction? I'm guessing not. Well, yes and no. So we do them at a minimum before we write a contract. And the reason that we do is we're making sure we disclose agency. 
Um, I prefer right. that they're done prior to that simply because uh, to your, now I'll, I'll say this, we have a zero cancellation policy. So in other words, I want you to sign it. So I want you to commit to me, but I also am going to follow that up with, if you want to fire me, fire me. And, and really what I'm doing is protecting myself from other agents who are out there going, Oh, do you have an agency agreement signed? No, you don't. Okay, great. I'll work with you. And if right. they say, Hey, I've got an agency agreement and that has a tendency to back age down. So, um, you know, is it enforceable? Theoretically, it's enforceable. Have I ever gone to court? Nope. And I no. probably never will. You? It's, not, it's not worth it. I'm not going to go sue one of my clients because they, you know, kind of shafted me and, you know, got, went around my agency agreement. So to me, it's more of, hey, if you sign this, you, we're committing to work together. And, and because of that, I feel like we get it. You know, you get a strong thing. But have I closed transactions without them? Absolutely. And, and it's not. Um, it's not the end of the world, but you know, case by case, I think is smart. Um, as you build a team out, one of the things that I always caution people of is you need to make policies. It's it's easy for us as rainmakers, as high producers, to use our judgment, and then. But the problem is sometimes we hire people who don't have the same judgment. So the bigger and more expansive you become as far as your team goes, then then you need to have more policies in place, and and, and you have to become a little bit more rigid. So. <laughs> It's totally fair. I mean, I, I hate to say when, you, you know, you might be brought up that New York City seems to be like no place else in many ways, in a very frustrating sort of way. It is like no place else. There are things we do and don't do here that don't necessarily add up and you kind of scratch your head. But quite frankly, I would say I've never met another New York City agent who has enforced a buyer's agreement. And so if you're the first person to introduce that, you know, are you pioneering something that makes sense? Probably, but you're also pioneering something that could be met with an enormous amount of resistance. I can't imagine what that would be like to pioneer something and be met with an enormous amount of resistance. That's never happened to me in my entire career. Um, okay, so <laughs> that's good stuff. So let me just, I want to jump to this couple of lighter questions that we have uh, from the group. Uh, <laughs> one is from uh, Dave Woodson, and, and this is, I mean, it's got to be asked. Dave's from the Chicago area, so he's got to know. Is it is it uh, Chicago style or New York style pizza? Come on, man. What what is it? I can't. I can't. Why would I ever? I, New York style. No question there. <laughs> like, that's not even a question. Uh, that's By the funny. Way, not to like not to throw salt on an open wound here, but I would sooner choose Detroit over Chicago. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> I like Chicago. I like deep dish, but uh, New York City pizza is like uh, it's the best that's funny all right good stuff all right so that said i want to also put a shout out there uh before i forget uh on a couple of things number one if you guys haven't signed up for listing agent boot camp yet make sure you do that we uh, have literally only a handful of tickets left uh we're getting close to being sold out vip is almost entirely sold out you can go to www.clubwealth.com uh, forward slash L A B C. Let me just put this in your chat here, but clubwealth.com forward slash L A B C uh, for to sign up for listing agent. Hold on, I'm typing this in listing agent boot camp. All right, this event sells out every year, so make sure you guys get signed up right away. It's going to be awesome. It is in San Antonio, Texas this year. And uh, the venue is amazing. Now, also, for those of you that would like to get a list of Jay's top 10 lead sources, go to uh, clubwealth.com forward slash Jay Glazer, J-A-Y-G-L-A-Z-E-R. And in our last five minutes here, we're going to see that Dave's laughing about that. He's like, yeah, okay, I get it. Dave, I, I got to go with deep dish is awesome, bro. I like I like them both. I just, pizza's pizza, right? It's it just all pizza. Pizza's not pizza, but okay. Oh, <laughs> you. Okay, must be from New York. All right, so that said, uh, let's go to our last five minutes. Guys, what are your final thoughts that you want to convey that you think are going to bring the most value to everybody listening right now? This is for me? For both of you. Yeah. Um, say, say, ask the question again. What's, the, what's your final thoughts? If you could only share one thing with us that would bring us the most value on our call today, what would that one thing be? It's a lot of stress. Um, I would say uh, have, a, have a business plan and stick to the business plan. I like it. So if you, if you could describe your business plan to us, what would it look like in, in, 30, in 60 seconds or less? What does your business plan look like? Gosh. 60 seconds. Uh, our business plan would be 
would be uh, lead generation, uh, revenue generation, um, cost, cost allocation, um, and then ultimately uh, lead and, and follow up. Okay. All right. And tell I mean, you it's like the most generic summary of, of a business plan, but you know, just knowing your numbers, tracking your numbers and then having them, you know, I, I, there's this philosophy. If you're, if you, if you don't have a destination, how, you know, how, how, how are you going to know how to get there? Mm -hmm. So, okay. So that's, a, that brings me to another good question. What is your destination in 2019? What are you going to accomplish in 2019? Yeah. So our goals for 2019 are sell uh, roughly 50 units for a uh, hundred million dollars in total volume, which would generate a GCI of roughly 3.5 million. Right on. Perfect. All right, Brian, final thoughts. Final thoughts. So I just want to say that there's a lot of different ways to do things. And I, you know, one of the things is we talked to Jay today that just kind of comes up for me is it, don't get caught in it doesn't work in my market. It does. This is market specific. I think we hear a lot of that. But, you know, take a look at what other people are doing from all over the country. This is why we do these type of things. So, you know, I've never thought of spending five thousand dollars on a video. But you know what? Maybe I should go out and spend a thousand dollars on a video and, you know, bring somebody in there to do that. Do, you know, help us out with that. Those are just different ways of looking at things. And there's opportunities out there. I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, you know, most people are reacting to the market and reacting to the things that are going on. I'm, my focus is trying to figure out how to be proactive. How do I do the thing before somebody else does it? How do I come up with the idea that doesn't, that someone else isn't doing? So, you know, I'm a big fan of rip off and duplicate, but I'm also a fan of being innovative, especially as things change in this market, look for that opportunity. And, you know, there's tons of opportunities anytime a market goes up or down or anytime a market shifts, anytime marketing shifts, anytime things change, there's an opportunity. And if you can find that opportunity, that's how we can go over the top. Love it. All right. And, you know, I would echo that, that, you know, there's lots of ways to do things. And too often in this industry, we get stuck on it has to be this way. And there's only one way to do it. And got to call expireds and call FISBOs and cold call. That's the only way you can do business. And, you know, or it's all referral all the time. And here's the reality, you guys, there's lots of ways to be successful in real estate. The key is you got to find what works for you and you got to get consistent at it. And there's really three things you got to do on a consistent basis every single day. If you want to be successful in any business, forget about real estate. You want to be successful in any business. There are three things. Can anybody guess what they are? Type it into your screen right now. If you can guess, what are the three things that you have to do on a daily basis to be successful? Pick any one of those three. What is one of the three things that you have to do every single day? And I'll give them to you right now. Lead generation, lead follow-up, and lead conversion. Those are the three things you got to do every day. In fact, 90% of your day is going to be spent in one way or another on one of those three things. And as you dial those three things in at a higher and higher and higher level, your income will soar and, and nothing else matters. All the other stuff is important, right? You got to, you got to take good care of the client and all this other stuff. But without those first three things, you will not succeed in any business, let alone real estate. Uh, and Doris, like, make your bed. I like that. I like that. That was actually a really good speech, by the way, the make your bed speech. But I can't remember Great the outcome, speech. Great one speech. of my favorite speeches of all time. So that said, Jay, we've got to wrap it up. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate you being on Club Wealth TV. We really also want to shout out to our sponsor, uh, Wise Hire. That's W-I-Z-E-H-I-R-E. -E. Uh, and I want to I'm typing that into the, the chat now too. But uh, Wise Hire is a company that Brian and I use to recruit for our teams and uh, highly recommend that if you guys aren't using Wise Hire already, you consider using those guys. We get a discount for you, uh, of course, at wisehire.com. Uh, and uh, so check, take a look at that. But that being said, Jay, seriously, thank you for being here. Appreciate you thank taking you the guys. time. Brian, thank you as always for co-hosting. And everybody, remember at the end of the day, inside you, there's a world-class beast just dying to get out. You got to choose to unleash that beast. So go do something at a world-class level today. Take care, guys. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.